which product industry, so, agriculture. Again, so it's not absolute losses. It's slower growth. That's what USITC's projections are for. Um, uh, I have actually a, a written statement here. Uh, good evening, co-chairs, uh, Senator Volk and Representative Saucier, honorable members of the commission. Thank you for listening to my testimony today. My name is Mike Hasty, and I live in South Berwick. I am the New England Regional Representative for the Alliance for Democracy and co-represent the Alliance for Democracy on the board of the Maine Fair Trade Campaign, along with my fellow Alliance for Democracy National Council member, Bonnie Preston. Um, I'm here to read someone else's uh, testimony, but I detected a major error in Mr. Trostel's testimony, and so I was wondering if I could make a quick, brief statement as the uh, representative of the Alliance for Democracy before I read the, it's just a one-page uh, testimony from the Electro Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, the uh, major, oh, what I think was a major error in Mr. Trostel's testimony, he said that the uh, uh, the debate uh, between uh, Marxist economics and uh, capitalist economics had been settled. And, uh, you know, I consider myself a, a Marxist, well, kind of a Marxist. I'm a socialist, but it's you know, really much more nuanced than that. If you're interested in my economic views, you could go to the Next System Project by uh, Gary Alperovitz. Uh, but uh, since I don't believe that Mr. Trostel is correct, that this debate has been settled, uh, in my position, I am prepared to offer him an opportunity to, to debate uh, some Marxist economics uh, who would, I know, love to debate Mr. Trostel. And so if he's interested in such a debate and settling the question of whether that debate has been settled once and for all and settling it himself once and for all, he can talk to me after the meeting. Uh, now I'll uh, get into the testimony I'm actually here to read. Uh, I'm submitting these comments on behalf of Jeremy Malcolm, Senior Global Policy Analyst for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. On copyright, the impact assessment states the TPP allows for fair use in activities like reporting, teaching, research, etc. It may allow for countries to permit these uses, but it does not require them to do so. This has a negative impact on U.S. companies that rely on copyright flexibilities as part of their business models. For example, in countries with restrictive copyright laws that lack, quote, fair use, websites that rely on fair use fall at risk of legal liability. This affects not only large companies like Google, whose news, books, and YouTube products are amongst those that rely on fair use, but also smaller startups who cannot afford exposure to potentially huge liability from copyright lawsuits. On digital trade, the impact statement states the TPP also prohibits requirements for source code disclosure, unquote. These requirements were not prepared in consultation with the information security community and have drawn criticism for foreclosing possible rules to promote public safety and security. For example, it might be a legitimate position for the U.S. to require a source code review of consumer level routers or firewalls imported from China to ensure that there are no back doors or security holes. On trade secrets, the impact assessment states, quote, the TPP is the first FTA to require criminal penalties for theft of trade secrets, unquote. Although true, this is actually one of the significant flaws of the TPP because of its potential for misuse by repressive countries such as Vietnam, Brunei, and Malaysia. I have uh, uh, printed copies for all the members of the statement as well as uh, uh, the uh, statement of uh, principle of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Thank you very much for your allowing me to testify. I'm signing in right now.
Good evening. Uh, my name is Matthew Beck. I'm the Vice President of Maine Fair Trade Campaign. I live in South Portland. I'm actually here to uh, read the testimony that was uh, uh, referenced earlier by the report authors by Timothy Wise, the Policy Research Director at the Global Development and Environment Institute at Tufts University. Please accept the following testimony on the 2016 Maine Trade Policy Assessment. The draft assessment reviews five studies containing projections of the Trans-Pacific Partnership's economic effects. These include the study by Jeronim Capaldo, Alex Zurieta, and Jomo Kwame Sundaram, published by the Global Development and Environment Institute at Tufts University under my direction. It is often referred to in the media as the Tufts study. The authors of the assessment criticized the Tufts study for having, quote, serious methodolog met methodological flaws and for not fully disclosing the underlying calculations. They also point out that the study has no connection with the Tufts University Economics Department. Unfortunately, the authors of the assessment offer little detail to substantiate their critiques and provide a selective bibliography that includes similar critiques of Capaldo and Enzurieta's study, but excludes their published responses to those critiques. In particular, Capaldo and Enzurieta have written relevant responses to analyses by the government of New Zealand, economists from think tanks and universities, including the Peterson Institute for International Economics and Harvard University, and the Congressional Research Service. The assessment also does not mention the praise of Capaldo and Isarieta's analysis of TBP by Nobel laureate Joseph Stieglitz. In dismissing Capaldo and Isarieta's study, the authors briefly mentioned three substantive points. Their own view that the model used is only appropriate for the short term, the fact that Capaldo and Isarieta assumed TPP to facilitate fiscal austerity leading to worse outcomes, and the fact that Capaldo and Isarieta assume unemployed workers to remain unemployed for a long time. However, the authors of the assessment failed to cite the many commentaries published by Capaldo and Isarieta in response to similar questions over the past two years. In these commentaries, Capaldo and Isarieta have explained why their model is in fact appropriate to analyze long-term effects and clarify the reasons for their assumptions on austerity and unemployment. Based on Capaldo and Isarieta's writing, available on GDAE's website, the reasons for their assumptions are straightforward. Their reading of recent history is that liberalization forces many governments to reduce deficits in the hope of attracting foreign investment. At the same time, Capaldo and Isurieta reject the assumption that full employment naturally establishes itself, an assumption extraordinarily frequent in analyses of trade liberalization and common to the other four studies reviewed in this assessment. By contrast, Capaldo and Isurieta assume that during economic downturns, firms lay off workers rather than renegotiating their salaries, and that laid off workers do not easily find jobs in expanding industries. It seems only appropriate for a study that analyzes the economic effects of TPP to not rule out unemployment by assumption. Yet the other studies reviewed in the assessment do just that. They also rule out any worsening of inequality and increases in the trade deficit, all phenomena that have been associated with past trade agreements and about which many citizens are legitimately concerned. These unrealistic assumptions strongly bias projections in favor of liberalization projects such as TPP. However, these shortcomings and their impacts on projected outcomes are not analyzed in the assessment. Neither does the assessment clearly point out that all reviewed studies, except Capaldo and Isurieta, use the same economic model whose assumptions virtually guarantee pro-liberalization outcomes. If the assessment's bias does not emerge from its misleading review of Capaldo and Isurieta's assumptions, it shows clearly in the remark that Capaldo and Isurieta do not disclose their calculations fully. To be sure, this is true. 
Capaldo and Isurieta do not disclose their computer code and other details of their projections, but neither do the authors of any of the other studies reviewed in this assessment. In published commentaries, Capaldo and Isurieta explain why they choose to abide by the disclosure standard of international organizations for a model housed at a UN agency and withhold their computer code. code. Disturbingly, these commentaries are not mentioned or considered in the assessment. Finally, despite the biased review it provides, one statement made in the assessment is indisputably true. There is no connection between Capaldo and Isurieta's study and Tufts Economics Department. The study has been produced as part of a research program at Tufts University's Global Development and Environment Institute, affiliated with the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy and the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. Capaldo is a GDAE Research Fellow. Thanks to a research collaboration with the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, GDAE has contributed to, develop, to developing the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, uh, the global policy model since 2014. This research has so far led to three analyses of its economic effects on modern day trade agreements, a study of the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, TTIP, a study on TPP, and a forthcoming study of the EU-Canada Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement, CETA. As is customary in economic research and academic research, all three studies have been initially published as GDAE working papers. Subsequently, the study of TTIP, the first in the series, has been published in a peer-reviewed journal, while the study on TPP has been submitted to a journal and received a favorable first review. The study on CETA will be released as a working paper this month, and it will be subsequently submitted to a journal. Based on these facts, the opinion expressed in the assessment that Capaldo and Isurieta's TPP study would not pass a peer review seems off the mark. The Maine Citizen Trade Policy Commission should continue to take the findings seriously if it is concerned with possible TPP impacts on unemployment and inequality, which other studies exclude by assumption. Thank you very much. Is there, where should I be signing in? Yes. Oh, I, I, Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Seth Berner. I live in Portland, Maine. I am just here as a citizen. I don't represent anybody. Um, in listening to the presentation of the, uh, of the report, um, one very significant assumption was made that uh, the state of Maine, which apparently is tracking at about 1% of national, uh, some national figures, is going to continue doing that uh, in the year 2032. Um, that's an assumption that cannot be made because that's exactly what I think this commission is charged with trying to determine. But I think there's very good reason to question that kind of assessment uh, or that kind of prediction. Um, Maine is a state in which um, infrastructure, both physical and intellectual, uh, is lagging behind the rest of the country. And this is particularly true if we think of Maine as, as two Maines, um, in which infrastructure in some of the rural areas is... is um, even uh, more behind um, uh, the southern and, and uh, the southern and more affluent parts of Maine. Um, this is a condition that is likely to uh, only continue deteriorating, and that's going to have a, a spiraling effect on how Maine will fit in with the national economy over the time. And uh, I can't draw any immediate conclusions about how TPP will affect this. Uh, but to assume that Maine will be in the position in 2032 that it's in now, I think, is, is unwarranted. Um, and in some fairly significant ways, I think there's reason to, to say that, that TPP will, will uh, accelerate um, this, um, 
Maine's, Maine's starting to fall behind. Um, for instance, if uh, the United States wanted to uh, adopt some policies on, on making uh, fishing uh, more sustainable than it has been um, with, with big net catches, um, it would probably take five minutes under the ISDS provisions for um, Japanese or, or other um, fishing industries to um, challenge those provisions and under the, um, the standards, which is that it's harming uh, international um, business, um, those provisions would, uh, that the protections would probably be found to be in violation of TPP, uh, not necessarily of previously enacted trade agreements, but specifically the TPP. And obviously this is going to in fact impact Maine to a far greater degree than it would Iowa. Um, and the same can be true, uh, is going to be true uh, about other, other things. Um, for instance, um, Maine, as was pointed out in the report, is, is very dependent on, on tourism. And that's true. Uh, but to the degree that um, some of our tourists are from the European Union, where there are much more stringent um, regulations on what is food, specifically uh, genetically modified organisms, uh, again, under the ISDS provisions of the um, uh, TPP, um, it's, it's almost certain that um, policies, uh, state, gov state policies um, that somehow restrict the use of GMOs in food or require labeling uh, would be found in, to be in violation of the TPP. Um, and that would obviously affect uh, an economy um, that is based on, on tourists if uh, we are hoping to attract people who are used to the protections of their, their home countries. They're not going to uh, feel, per probably not going to feel particularly safe in a place where uh, they, they feel that they're uh, ingesting things that are harmful to them. Um, and, and in looking at, at economics and, and tourism, um, the ISDS in particular um, is dangerous beyond anything that we have seen before. It's basically abrogating government responsibility to what we call police powers, um, the protection of our public. Um, so manufacturing under the trade uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership is not going to be subject to the kind of clean air uh, standards that we would like to have in place. And it's quite possible that if, if Maine wants to, to fight its way to the bottom in terms of, of protections and turn us into Houston, where the air is absolutely unbreathable, it's probably possible, but it's going to pretty significantly impact uh, the major part of our economy that's based on tourism. Um, because uh, Houston environment in, in sub-zero weather is just not going to be a place that people are going to choose to come. Um, so I think for significant ways, um, the report that was presented to this commission really doesn't look at, at a reality of how the TPP would affect Maine uh, and, and makes a, a pretty significant unwarranted assumption about how the TPP is going to affect Maine moving forward, uh, both in a vacuum, because I think we want to be looking at Maine uh, on, its, on, its, on our own two feet, as it were, but also as, as Maine will keep up uh, against the rest of the country. Uh, and, one, and one last point. Um, every place in the report uh, in which there were references to um, sort of uh, average expected benefits, um, this isn't talking in terms of median, in the sense of where is it going to fall across population as a whole. Um, if some people at the top find benefits of, of thousands of dollars and, and large numbers of people at the bottom find benefits close to zero, well, there's going to be a net average gain, uh, but it's going to continue uh, the process of creating two mains, one in which there are people who are, who are comfortable and people who are not. So even looking at the numbers, which I think are, are tremendously optimistic, looking at the numbers that were in the report that were presented to you, um, it's not enough to take those at face value. You really have to be asking, how is that going to affect the population of Maine as, a, as an entire state?
Hi, my name is uh, Ezra Silk. I live in Portland, and I'm representing an organization called the Climate Mobilization, or a national group here today. Um, the, a couple, in July, I helped um, with a group of people amend the Democratic Party platform um, to include the following language about the global climate emergency. Uh, it's on page 45 of the, of the Democrats' platform, it says, we believe the United States must lead in forging a robust global solution to the climate crisis. We are committed to a national mobilization and to leading a global effort to mobilize nations to address this threat on a scale not seen since World War II. In the first 100 days of the next administration, the president will convene a summit of the world's best engineers, climate scientists, policy experts, activists, and indigenous communities to chart a course to solve the climate crisis. So towards the end of this uh, summit that the Democrats have committed to, I wrote up a victory plan um, detailing what this World War II scale mobilization would look like. There's a wide variety of policies because there's an enormous amount of things we need to do. Um, rapidly phasing out fossil fuels, transforming our food system, conserving resources, restoring ecosystems, removing excess carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and creating full employment. Um, we believe these steps are necessary to protect civilization from a catastrophic ecological crisis. Um, after I published this uh, last month, a number of people, including representatives from the Maine Fair Trade Campaign, informed me that the policies we were calling for could be blocked as a result of the uh, proposed Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement. In particular, I was told that the ISDS provisions would expose the U.S. to legal liability from investors for undertaking the policies called for in the plan. So I'm here today to ask the Commission to strongly consider recommending that the ISDS be taken out of the TPP, the provisions. Um, our best climate scientists are now telling us that we need emergency action to eliminate greenhouse gas emissions across all sectors. Um, every moment that we delay this emergency mobilization, we are increasing the risk of a catastrophic disruption of the global food supply. Uh, as extreme drought drastically slashes yields and increases prices. Uh, as we're now seeing in Syria, extreme drought can cause civil war, the breakdown of society, and massive flows of refugees across borders. Um, the best way to ensure continued international trade is to restore a safe, to restore a safe and stable climate uh, through this mobilization. It would be ironic and tragic if this proposed trade deal cause the breakdown of international trade by blocking the action we need to avert abrupt global warming. Thank you. Good evening. Oh, good evening. Uh, my name is Chris Miller. I live in scenic gray, Maine. I'm probably a socialist, if not a communist at this point in time. Um, 20 years ago or so, I started Maine's first internet service provider. I've testified before here about intellectual property. I know a lot about that, but I'm not going to talk about that today. And the points I wanted to bring up were just brought up by the previous speaker as to ISDS and climate change issues. The economic study asked how Maine might respond to future increases in trade. Every dollar, I'll point out, every dollar of increased economic activity, even if it's the $20 or $30 that the Portland downtown people are so happy gets spent by every visitor on a first night, further melts the polar ice caps. It destroys more species. It destroys everything that we depend on to live. That's important. That's something that the economic study did not pick up on. I want to talk about the real issue here, though, which is legitimacy. This is a whole sellout done in secret by corporate lobbyists. You guys get $10,000 every two years. What did one of those corporate lobbyists get paid per hour? It would be kind of nice if I had my magic wand that maybe one of the outcomes that this commission could think of is banning all those corporations and lobbyists from doing business with and in the state of Maine. Mm. But I'm just dreaming. So the real issue is legitimacy. Seth covered the stuff about the Gini index and inequality, about how one big corporation making lots more money while everyone else goes into slavery. Mm, that's a net economic benefit. I did my six years at MIT studying economics. So this isn't about fair trade, free trade. It's about greed, unfettered greed. 
and making life easier for corporations. That's what it's really about. And I am under attack by those corporations. And you are all under attack, unless you're wealthy enough. If you're black, if you live somewhere else in the world, you're probably used to that already. But this is coming home and it's gonna be biting all of us you know, wealthy, well-to-do white folks as well here in Maine. Strange times, times are changing as Dr. You said in 10 years things will be entirely different. They will be entirely different, entirely different. Thank you. Uh, good evening, my name is Jeffrey Neal Young and I'm here this evening to focus really on the ISDS provisions that have just been referenced by the prior two speakers. I do have uh, written testimony. I apologize. I apparently did not make enough copies for everyone. So after I'm done speaking, I'll provide my one additional copy. <laughs> um, my testimony is based upon my experience as an attorney for some 30 years who regularly represents working people in courts and in arbitration. I think although the goals of the TPP are laudable and understandable, promoting free trade among the United States and other countries. I believe the bill as proposed is unacceptable because of the dispute resolution mechanism. So I'm not here to talk about the economics or job creation. I'm here to simply talk about what happens if there's a dispute under this bill. What the TPP would do would be to divest courts of jurisdiction to resolve suits by corporations and governments in which corporations assert that some type of governmental action, such as the promulgation of labor and environmental regulations, violates the TPP. Instead, what the TPP does is it establishes an investor to state dispute, resol dispute settlement process, or ISDS for short, by which private panels composed of three attorneys will resolve disputes. What's the problem with resolving disputes with private arbitration rather than through the courts? The problems, I think, are numerous. Arbitrators who would be deciding trade disputes are not strictly neutral, like a judge or jury. The arbitrators often represent corporate clients in trade disputes before the ISDS, and as a result, they may have a vested interest in reaching decisions which can be used later on for the benefit of their own corporate clients. Secondly, arbitrators who decide trade disputes may have an interest in favoring private corporations over government because it may result in more corporate work for them. Third, because of the sizable awards which some ISDS panels have issued under different trade acts, which uh, awards have been in excess of foreign investment, Governments of times have been forced to settle suits and withdraw regulations for fear of a large award. Um, the TPP has weak conflict of interest rules, and finally, there is no review or virtually no review of an arbitration award. And because of the danger of the ISDS private arbitration panels, a number of respected organizations and scholars including those who generally are in favor of the free trade agreements, have come to oppose the ratification of the TPP. Uh, earlier this month, just on September 7, some 220 law and economics professors, including Jeffrey Sachs, a professor at Columbia who is a prominent supporter of free trade, Nobel Prize laureates Joseph Stinglitz, Harvard Law Professor Lawrence Tribe sent a letter to Congress opposing ratification because of the ISDS provisions, and I've provided a link to all these papers uh, in my own written remarks so that if you want to look at them, you'll be able to access them. Um, there was a recent four-part expose by a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist, Chris Hamby, that exposed the danger of the arbitration panels. Uh, last year, November 2015, the Columbia Center on Sustainable Investment issued a report highlighting the dangers of the private resolution mechanism. Other groups which are opposing the ISDS scheme include the National Conference of State Legislatures and the Pro Free Trade Cato Institute, among others. To be sure, 
the ISDS resolution mechanism is not a new concept. It's been employed in other trade bills, including NAFTA. But TPP is what I would call NAFTA on steroids. It greatly expands the use of the three-person arbitration panels and threatens our ability right here in the United States itself, not just overseas, <coughs> but here in our own country to enact regulations. To date, because of the number of limited foreign investors in the United States in the trade agreements, like NAFTA, which generally have only included Canada, the ISDS resolution scheme has not really been an issue here. However, the TPP includes Japan and Australia as signatories, and a study has shown that there are 9,000 foreign investors in the United States which would be able to bring claims before private arbitration panels as opposed to being able to bring suit or in court. Thus, not only is the ISDS scheme a problem in other countries, but the private arbitration mechanism would permit foreign investors in the United States to challenge our own labor and environmental regulations enacted by Congress and government agencies. And if you think that I'm some kind of crazy lawyer making this up, you can check out a recent ISDS action by TransCanada, which is suing the U.S. government in one of these private arbitration panels for $15 billion for the Obama administration's decision not to go forward with the Keystone Pipeline. So in effect, this private arbitration panel can overrule our, go our own government's actions. I told you at the outset that I was going to be speaking from my experience of over 30 years as an attorney. During that period, I've increasingly seen private arbitration supplant the courts as the final arbiters of all types of consumer and labor disputes. Corporations have required consumers and workers to give up their rights to pursue grievances in the state courts and the federal courts, both individually and collectively, if they want to utilize a service like your cable TV that you get from Time Warner or to obtain employment. The New York Times, the New York Times detailed that trend and the problems with private arbitration in a three-part series last year. So I'm not here to say that arbitration in and of itself is a bad thing. I represent and do a lot of arbitrations myself, but they're voluntary. They're mutually agreed upon between the parties. Party can elect to decide that arbitration is a better mechanism than filing suit in court. But when you have what I would call forced arbitration, which is essentially what you have in the TPP dispute resolution process with the ISDS, then a party doesn't choose whether it wants to go to court. It has no choice. It simply is required to go before a three-person arbitration panel. And I think that's a threat here in our own country to our own environmental and labor legislation, which Congress may choose to enact to protect our citizens. Thank you. Um, am I correct that if uh, a foreign investor or a foreign nation brings suit against an American corporation and they win, there's no recourse for that American company to go to the Supreme Court to have that overturned because an international trade agreement has more, more authority than the Supreme Court? That I don't want to say it has more authority than the Supreme Court, but I think you're essentially correct, Representative Patrick, that what this bill would do instead it was it would take the suit away from the courts, would allow a three-person arbitration panel composed of private sector arbitrators to decide it, and there wouldn't be any review of the decision. So if the decision was against a U.S. corporation, um, or against the U.S. government, the government, in essence, would be required to pay out for enacting unlawful legislation. Um, yes, just a request. Could you email your testimony to um, Rob Kiermaier? And that way, he can email it to us, and we'll have the links. <laughs> sure. Oh, I see. Of course, it's not. Yeah, I can do that. And, and just a clarification, I think the ISDS is cases against the government, not against from corporation to corporation, just right, I'm sorry. clarification, and I, I think you clarified that, but okay, thanks.
Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, thank you. My name is Randall Parr. I'm uh, a resident of Appleton, Maine, and uh, I'm a former labor market economist from the uh, Department of Manpower Affairs. Uh, I uh, have a master's in economics from University of Massachusetts as well as a, a Master of Science from uh, Bentley University. I was also a lobbyist for this commission, uh, for the bill that created this commission 13 years ago. I lobbied uh, for the first time in Augusta, and uh, we got it passed, and th thank you for being here. Um, I've also uh, spoken to the Finance Committee to support bills for public banking uh, over the past uh, several sessions, uh, none of which have passed yet, but hopefully maybe next time, next year. Uh, but the, that's one of the concerns I have with this uh, TPP. I understand from reputable sources that actually public banking will be considered a, uh, a trade barrier, and therefore it would not it would not be allowed. If we were to have it, we would not be able to create a public bank in Maine uh, if uh, we if TPB gets passed. Uh, I have actually a number of short points and, and hopefully I can get through this real quickly. Uh, a lot of uh, the, my testimony uh, has already been given so I'm not going to uh, repeat it. And uh, I'm very concerned about the loss of sovereignty by our, our public bodies, our uh, legislatures and our state uh, uh, and municipal uh, organizations, uh, laws and ordinances and so forth can all be overturned by TPP. Um, I believe the study which I read last night um, was a little bit too rosy on the actual impact of uh, TPP and uh, uh, if you look at concentration of wealth over the past 30 years it's uh, been uh, a, a lot fewer people have a lot higher uh, share of the wealth of the world, and a lot, of, and, and the same is true of income. And I believe that is partially due to the trade uh, deals that we passed, uh, NAFTA, CAFTA, Panama, and so forth. And uh, I'd like that to be looked at. Um, we look at concentration of economic power. I believe that's a major problem in the world today. Uh, the you know the gloves have been taken off, uh, I should say, uh, well, that's a bad, bad analogy, but uh, actually I believe that really we have not been enforcing the antitrust laws over the past uh, 20 or 30 years since 1980, and we've had uh, a huge balance of tra trade deficit starting in the 80s, starting with Reagan and all the way forward, uh, which we didn't have uh, in the 70s and 60s and so forth, where we had strong economic prosperity high growth rates, we had, uh, people could find jobs fairly easily, and I think I would call it prosperity. But uh, we haven't had that lately. Uh, since 2008, the economy has been relatively flat. And I agree with their conclusion that you, your expected benefit of this TPP would be 0.15%. That's almost like saying, no, there's no benefit. There's no benefit to GDP. There's no benefit to the economy. So, yes, <laughs> this is a bad deal for everybody. And um, the, uh, but Fast Track says that no one can change it. Fast Track says that either you vote it up or you vote it down, but no amendments are allowed. So, I, you know, there's only one solution, and that is to vote it down. Um, I'd like to look at the Constitution Article 2, Section 2, Paragraph 2, uh, it says that basically you trade, treaties require, treaties require two-thirds of the Senate, U.S. Senate vote in order to be passed. But NAFTA did not have that. It only had about 53 votes out of 100 senators. Um, CAFTA, they, that's a Central American Free Trade Agreement, didn't have that either. Go look at the history and you'll see it didn't have that. Uh, this new fast track says 
a majority of the House and a majority of the Senate supersedes Article 2, Section 2, Paragraph 2. And the Supreme Court has never ruled on that. Actually, they, turned, they actually decided not to rule. They didn't accept the case. Uh, and uh, I believe in Mississippi, the steelworkers challenged it. And uh, it was turned down on the grounds that it was a political issue. And they did not have to decide on it. Um, I think those are all the points I wanted to make. Uh, China is not in this deal, by the way, which is uh, the strongest economy in the world. The four top banks in the world in terms of assets, the high, largest banks are all China banks, Chinese banks of various provinces and so forth. And they're all public banks. They're owned by the government. Uh, and they have a very strong economy because they're able to actually to um, counter counteract existing economic trends when there's a recession, they will uh, spur more growth and spending. So their growth rate has <laughs> gone down, but it's still way, way above all of the Western world. Not that that's necessarily a good thing, because actually, because actually we now have a very strong carbon economy, as one of the other witnesses said, and we are really maybe fortunate that our economy is depressed because we're not destroying the climate at a rate that other states are, but uh, yeah, we're poor as, as a result, but we're, we're poor, we have a rich environment. So uh, poverty is, I mean, money is not always the, the bottom line, but uh, really, especially for young people, uh, our grandchildren, uh, our great-grandchildren, our, our, our children, it's very important that we have a strong, growing economy, and hopefully an environmentally friendly economy, uh, eliminate uh, carbon emissions and so forth, have a solar economy, and um, have uh, hopefully eliminate the carbon uh, that's being currently consumed, or emit, you know, emitted from vehicles and so forth, have uh, moved to electric vehicles, and, and so forth. But we're, we're going to try to keep this limited to the comments from the Yes. And I know you're passionate. Thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, I don't really have any other comments. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Hi, um, my name is Fred Morrill. I'm from Tenants Harbor, uh, and uh, very short. Very short. Um, the legitimacy question uh, of uh, the, ever, the nullifying, partially or totally, of national sovereignty. Uh, you know, that's pretty god awful. The tribunals uh, for dispute resolution. Uh, that's awful. Um, I just thought of a title of a book I read a long time ago, and I'm going to take a look at it again. It's called The Human Use of Human Beings. Uh, maybe Robert Heilbronner, maybe somebody else wrote it. And um, the, uh, these trade deals uh, certainly uh, go in the other direction, away from the uh, human use of human beings, to put it technically. Uh, third point. Um, Let's see, it isn't official, but uh, this thing could also be called, uh, loosely it could be called Shafta, the, um, <laughs> and uh, it fits nicely with the previous uh, AFTA. The Southern Hemispheric Era Area uh, Free Trade Agreement, um, I, didn't, I made a t-shirt, but uh, the ink's faded and everything, so I'm not wearing it right now. But uh, just uh, think of Shaft along with TPP and all the other stuff. So thanks very much. My name is Craig DeRay. I'm a Portland resident. I mostly want to underscore when you're evaluating the value of the substantial study that you've got in front of you, uh, that in my opinion, it doesn't necessarily get to the heart of the matter what you need to evaluate, which is basically the amount of societal benefit that it affords Mainers. 
I say that because they use words like overall gains to society, implying overall economic gains. I believe that you should be looking at overall societal gains itself. Economics is part of that. But you need to think about all the other things that it costs us. People have talked about what the courts, uh, the, the, the extra layer of, the extra national layer of courts that this is going to cost us, which will lead into our sovereignty and our abilities to regulate our own laws and well-being of our citizens. In addition, I again want to underscore the point that they are looking at per capita gains. Okay, that's an average. That means if the 1% or 2% or maybe 5%, uh, generally speaking, these things tend to taper up and at a higher rate increasing all the time. Those gains tend to be concentrated in that upper tier. That means that there's not much, if anything, and in reality, usually nothing left for everyone else. That's why the median should be looked at in these studies. Why they didn't look, select a median to evaluate, I don't know. I suspect <laughs> that it's kind of cherry picking statistics that you it might would be want. Impossible, actually, with the data we had. It's, <laughs> uh, well, if you say, if, as you say, I, I believe there must be ways. Uh, the economists accomplish things uh, looking at medians all the time. No, because we would have to know what each person was going to receive in 2032 to get a median. We only know what the whole state will receive, so we could only calculate an average. Uh, I, I, I'm going to just disagree that I, I'm pretty sure that there would be a way that there's a median that could be estimated uh, at some level or another, get some kind of a close idea or approximation. In particular, I'd like to see a PPP uh, median that would be evaluated. And regardless of whether or not they can calculate a median, if they can't, I don't know how much good just a average is going to be when you're evaluating the overall societal benefit there. So even if they cannot get to a median, I, I really want to put to you to question how much an importance that per capita value really weighs on your decision making when you're evaluating the overall societal value that this thing is going to allow. Thank you. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yes, we all, we all took that to heart, and I think there's a whole list of people already signed up. So I want to keep my comments very, very brief. Um, I concur with all of the people who've used the word sovereignty, and to, um, to just speak directly to, it's Senator Patrick, correct? I can't quite read it, <laughs> sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, it's, it's Eli Etchcombe and I'm from the town of Scarborough. To speak to the issue of sovereignty and Senator Patrick's question earlier, we're not talking about um, an abstract concept of sovereignty. We're talking about literally no longer having the right as a nation to form our own laws to benefit our citizens or to protect our citizens from something we know is bad. Who here on the panel is familiar with what's happening in Australia right now with um, the lawsuit about cigarette packaging? All right, you can make sure you tell <laughs> the rest of the members your perspective on it as well. But this is an example of the kind of thing that can happen. Australia realized that their smoking rates were ridiculously high and it was hurting their economy, it was hurting their population in general. So they created, um, instead of that little box that we have, they created this big warning that had really nasty pictures of the reality of cigarette smoking and lo and behold, it worked. Their smoking rates went down. They, they saw a problem in their society, they came up with a solution, they tried it, they were successful and now they're being sued because corporate profits in cigarette sales are hurting. This isn't an abstract concept of sovereignty. If, I agree that the numbers and the, um, 
the general tone of the assessment is rosy. Frankly, I expected it to be rosier. I expected to hear numbers beyond almost zero benefit. And the fact that we don't see that, even nationally, that, it's, that, that there's no real benefit measured against the, um, the vigor with which our president wants to push this through tells me there's something other than actual trade that is at stake here. And it's got to be our sovereignty. This matters to the people of Maine. And I guarantee you, it matters to the voters. OK? Thank you very much. Sorry for the confusion. All right. That's when I thought I understood what was going on. But I want to follow Harlan Baker now. It's good news. Uh, good evening. My name's, my name's Douglas Bourne. Uh, I'm the president of Southern Maine Labor Council. Uh, I live in Auburn, I should, I should say. Uh, I'm here uh, to read a statement on behalf of the Maine Fair Trade Campaign, though, where I also serve as on the executive board. While my testimony does not relate directly to the assessment itself, there is another issue that has come to our attention that raises concerns to us. Uh, you'll be pleased to know I, this will only take a moment. The Trade Promotion Authority law, which authorizes the TPP negotiations, recently added an explicitly new provision to the effect that the TPP could not affect any inconsistent law at the state level. This was an important change from previous rounds, which provided that state law could be challenged by the federal government if it was inconsistent with the trade agreement. The issue is that the USTR, the US Trade Representative, has drafted implementing legislation that ignores the TPA language and reverts to the old model for, pre <clears throat> excuse me, for preempting state law. So we'd like to ask the Commission to look into this question. If certain protective language has been agreed to, will the Commission please find out why the federal government would choose to use implementing language to undermine it? Thank you. I have copies of, uh, of this for everybody. to USTR, and so I've gotten a memo from um, Georgetown Law Professor Matt Porterfeld, who's a trained lawyer professor on this issue, so I will forward that to the commission so you can take a look at it, but essentially the um, implementing legislation or the draft proposal for implementing legislation that's been submitted by President includes a provision in there that says that the federal government has the authority to sue the states if there's a state law or policy that is in conflict with the TPP. And that is what his view and the legislation and the, the um, Congressional Committee report says is something that was not intended to happen under the Trade Promotion Authority, which has a new explicit reference saying that state and local laws are not preempted. So I will provide that information to the commission and so that we have some background on that. But I, yeah, so anyway. If I could just add, that, that whole document that you're referring to was in the last series of articles of interest that is on the internet and we published it. Okay, because well, what I will add to that is there's been some back and forth because the ICPAC had a meeting on the phone with USTR that said, don't worry, nothing's changed in the, t in the train promotion. That didn't mean anything. That new language didn't mean anything. So I now have Professor Porterfield's rebuttal <laughs> of the USTR. So I will provide all of that again to the committee um, so you have that. 